welcome the name which is above all other names, that of the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son. I'm Brian Mason, and this is our prayer program. I'm going to start today with a piece that I found in the Protestant Valley of South Africa and their winter edition and that is about William Tyndale a man who denied the world for the sake of God's word William Tyndale was born in England near the border of Wales in the 1480s he was the servant of God and was martyred, strangled and burnt at the stake at Ville Vaude near Brussels in 1536. The English speaking world owes a huge debt of gratitude to him because he played a pivotal role in the translation of a good deal of the Bible. It was largely for this that he was put to death. In addition to his rejection of the false teachings of Roman Catholicism on the priesthood, the Pope and numerous other topics. Tyndale's attitude is well embodied in his response to a Roman Catholic clergyman who asserted to Tyndale that we had better be without God's laws than the Pope's. Tyndale responded, I defy the Pope and all his laws, and if God spares my life ere many years, I will cause the boy that driveth the plough to know more of the Scriptures than thou dost. Everything that denies or obscures scripture must go. A churchman reportedly warned Tyndale of the danger of opposing Rome. Do you not know that the Pope is very antichrist? But beware what you say. For if you shall be perceived to be of that opinion, it will cost you your life. Thankfully, that did not deter Tyndale. God blessed him and enabled him to translate the New Testament and part of the Old Testament. The work had to be smuggled into England and the Roman Catholic Church burnt it as fast as they could find it. Numerous phrases now common in English such as my brother's keeper and the law unto themselves can be found in his work. Alas, he was betrayed by a friend and did not finish his work on the Old Testament prior to his arrest and murder. His final words spoken at the stake with a fervent zeal and a loud voice were reported as Lord, open the King of England's eyes. By God's grace, two years later in 1538, Henry VIII, no friend of Protestants, commanded that the Bible in English be placed in all churches to be accessible to the common people. And so the light of Christ arose in England. He wrote to John Frith concerning his translation. I call God to record against the day we shall appear before our Lord Jesus. That I never altered one syllable of God's word against my conscience. Nor would do this day if all that is in earth whether it be honour, pleasure or riches, might be given me. 
Reader, the Western world was blessed with the Word of God, and it made all the difference for nigh on five hundred years. But now the West, and much of the professing church in the West, has rejected that Word. The light that came with that Word will soon depart unless there is repentance. Relish the privilege that you have of God's word in your tongue and proclaim him and live for him lest he take away the greatest blessing that we have. For though, yes, it's wonderful. Oh, in fact, it gives that this was written by a Dr. Kenneth Allen. Yes, a nice, nice piece that helps us to understand what it cost and remember what when was it in in June middle of June this year it was actually in Gloucestershire and did a did a recording uh, with the monument to, to William Tyndale behind me the word of God Psalm 119 and verse 105 Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path O God thank thee for thy servant William Tyndale who all those years ago translated so much of the Bible into English a man who stood against the heresies of the Roman Catholic Church. A man who was determined to have the word of God in English so that people could hear the word of God in their own language and be able to understand that word. Yet in these days it's as though ones like William Tyndale never existed because there has been that rebellion against thyself. Rebellion which has undoubtedly been instigated by the Jesuits. And it is in this light that the Jesuits are behind this current day rebellion against thyself through heresies which have been brought into once strong Protestant denominations and that there has been that despising of thy word. Bring thy judgment against this situation and against these Jesuits and against those Protestant denominations which have trodden underfoot the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and that the light of thy word and the light of the Lord Jesus Christ shall once more re be restored into England as William Tyndale laid his life down, he has not laid it down in vain, even in these days of great apostasy. For this is asked that the Lord Jesus Christ will be preeminent once more, not just in England, but throughout the whole of the British Isles, for thy glory. Amen. Going to, to read now. Let's put that over there. Something which I have actually written, and it is from based on the scripture. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. 
That's from Hebrews chapter 4 and the 10th verse. And all the scripture verses are from the authorized King James Version. In this verse is found one of those divine truths which are designed to take those who know that they belong to the Lord Jesus Christ into the place where God wants them to be. It is wonderful to be saved. It is wonderful to have been healed. Yet it is even more wonderful to be in such a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ that he is able to fulfill all his divine plan through those who are absolutely abandoned to him. The divine plan for individual lives was known unto God even before the foundation of the world. A plan which is filled with divine purpose and when brought into operation is to the glory of God. This plan initially is a response to the Lord Jesus Christ's call to come unto me, all ye that are la labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, and the 28th verse. At first, rest is the redemption that is in the Lord Jesus Christ and leads to salvation. A rest which saves from the jaws of hell and hell's never-ending torments. A rest which brings eternal life at the end of the earthly pilgrimage. A rest which is the guarantor through the blood of the eternal covenant of all the promises of God. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the, the blood of the everlasting covenant, Hebrews chapter 13 and the 20th verse. Initially, this is the place of rest whereby the soul is reconciled to God through repentance and faith. A rest dependent upon the one perfect offering for sin made through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The world is incapable of giving this rest. In fact, this is just the opposite, especially for the believer. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, Therefore the world hateth you. St. John's Gospel, chapter 15, and the 18th and 19th verses. Rest then in the verse being considered, Hebrews 4.10. Does not come from the world, neither is this solely based on being saved. God does not want any believer to come short of this blessed rest where each ceases from their own works. There is a place where God wants you to be. This is where the Holy Ghost begins to work. The life within a life. The beginning of a mighty work of God. When you, the reader, can then know that you have not your you are not your own for you are absolutely possessed by God these are days where there appears to be few who rest in God and evidence that they have ceased from their own works plans based on human thinking 
and carried out by human endeavors will interfere with the power of God. Only that which is wholly at rest in God, having ceased from your own works, shall give the Holy Ghost full possession of yourself in order to bring the divine imprint into being through you. There then comes the words, the thoughts, so divinely in the Holy Ghost that you shall know what to do and when to do it. What a life! A life of, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. St. John's Gospel, chapter 15, and the 7th verse. The grand entrance to a life of secret joys has been opened through the ceasing from your own works. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Psalm 25, and the 14th verse. In the life of rest comes the intimacy of how God shows himself to you, even in small things. He knows every detail of your individual life. As you go on resting in God, you do not need to ask what his will is. This is because the thought of choosing anything other than his will shall never come. Should there be the danger of choosing what he does not want, then be sure he will give you a check in your spirit with the opportunity to heed the warning. This is one outworking of the ceasing from your own works. Another outworking of the trials which will come your way in order to bring you into the fullness of God, whereby you come to trust him in every situation. And the same day, when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, and the 35th verse. An example was in the case of the disciples crossing over the sea and the storm started to rage. They cried to the Lord. He did eventually answer after first looking to test their faith in himself. In order to bring you into the fullness of all that God has for you, God shall bring his trials each one, in whatever form these come, are from his hand, and sent that you shall give him his rightful place in your life. In getting his rightful place in your life, God is then receiving the glory, which only he should receive. This is true, even in the fiercest storm, and when you are in danger of being overwhelmed. As with this scriptural example, is seen in the life of Smith Wigglesworth. That great faith came through great tests. Smith Wigglesworth welcomed the tests which came his way. Will you also welcome great tests from the hand of God? For each time your faith is tested, this becomes a further step into a life which proves time and again what it is to have the rest of faith. Faith then is strengthened through these times of testing, just as the dawn follows the night. So you shall find complete rest in him lead you to an even higher level in the plan of God for your life, all of which is to the glory of God.
going to to pray for the country of Qatar. So over here is Qatar in the in the Middle East. Another country of very high levels of persecution. Revelation chapter chapter one and verses seven and eight. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, Amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Almighty God, Bring before thee the country of Qatar, and people there which are bound by the very devil himself, deceived through darkness, the devil's own darkness. And I cry unto you, for the light of the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to be shed into the hearts of those who are as yet bound by the darkness in that country that spiritual darkness and that they shall have the opportunity of receiving your word that they shall know the truth and the truth shall make them free to be brought into a living relationship with yourself the living God through the atoning blood of thy son the Lord Jesus Christ by repentance of their sins and the cleansing of the precious blood of the Lord Jesus that blood and only that blood which can bring forgiveness of sins to sinners. This is us, this is done, that you shall be glorified through the Son. Amen. Is revival possible in a time of increasing evil? Let's see what what verses we're to follow. Yes, been directed here by what what I've received from Alec Dunn to Isaiah chapter thirty five. Always keep to the scriptures, not to um, traditions of men, tradition of churches, denominations, or whatever. The final authority comes with God and through his written word. A comparative promise is given in Isaiah 35. So I read verses 4 to 10. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf 
they shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert, and the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes, and an highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return, and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Oh, the word of God. Promises there in the word of God. Are you believing on the promises of God in these days? This is one of the most wonderful passages in the Bible. Even in the midst of a spiritual desert, waters and streams will gush forth, meaning his spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, will flow in revival power. Not only that, God will provide and God will set up a holy highway for his people, giving them great joy and gladness. If ever the Bible promises God coming in power and bringing life, healing and hope and joy in times of spiritual famine, this is it. Plead it before our gracious God. Almighty God, what wonderful, wonderful promises in thy word. That which speaks that even in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. That is the coming of thy Holy Spirit in reviving moves, reviving power. And this surely, as you can see, in Britain at this time, there is that wilderness, that desert, where the Holy Spirit is not flowing because of apostasy, because of rebellion, because man and woman have rejected you. Thy word has been rejected. O oh God, how much more do you want me to cry unto you before you answer? The heart is broken, but how much more is your own heart broken in seeing a nation which men like William Tyndale gave their lives for the scriptures. Oh, find those in these days who will be like William Tyndale, where the men are women, women like those who I was making that recording last week in southwest Scotland. Those two dear women Margaret Wilson and Margaret Lacken, 
and were tied to that stone stake and left for the tide to come in and drown them because they would not compromise. They would not give in to the Church of Rome or establish religion of the day because they wanted your word and they wanted that freedom for your word to be preached in the churches and the way of salvation made known through the atoning blood of thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. O oh God, help, help me to be that instrument in these days whereby the Holy Spirit will pray through to bring about the revival which only the revival from thyself God coming down as God will save this nation in these days bringing the nation to its knees the nation to repentance and to begin in the house of God Amen How should we pray for revival? Daniel Nash was an American who lived in the early part of the 19th century. He prayed with such persistence and intensity that people thought he was mad. He locked himself away in the room to pray and hardly ate or drank. People were concerned for his health and sanity but he didn't care. God used him to bring about the greatest revival in the history of the world as regards the effects on the community that of Rochester in the state of New York in 1830 and 1831. The awesome sense of the presence of God was so all-pervading not only during the revival meetings but for years afterwards. That ten years after the crusade meetings had finished the crime rate in the city was less than a third of what it had been before the revival. That was amazing enough. But what made it even more incredible was the fact that during th that same period the population of the city increased threefold. Daniel did not attend a single meeting but just cried out to God to come down in power. Shortly after the meetings ended, Daniel died. The world has never seen anything like it before or since. This is conclusive proof of the difference that one man's prayers can make when that person prays in the way that Jesus has shown us. And what did Jesus say? If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye, ye will, and it shall be done unto you. A key verse in intercession. St. John's Gospel, chapter 15 and the 7th verse. O God, Father, through thy beloved Son, 
and having that identical faith of thy son, I cry unto you, O God, to come down in power. Yes, this Daniel, this dear, dear man, Daniel Nash, shutting himself away, or eating or drinking, is crying unto you, and you heard and you answered for your glory. O oh God, have mercy. Have mercy upon me, should I not pray through. For this is the responsibility of the intercessor, to pray through and get the answer. And whilst revival tarries, I have not prayed through. Help me, O oh God, to be that which you want me to be. So that you and your perfect will shall be done. That you alone shall receive the glory. Amen. The use of preaching in revival. What qualities then should our preachers today have to be like the true revival preachers? They must have a deep personal experience of the grace of God in Christ. No one can take a person further than he has gone himself. Gilbert Tennant was such a powerful preacher, partly because he had passed through many deep and heart-searching convictions. They must be humble and always make sure that God gets all the glory for everything in them and everything done through them. They must be self-deprecating. Our God cannot trust them with revival. They must accept the Bible as the word of God. Let me just turn up this particular scripture that's quoted. Again in Isaiah. Seems to be very much a key, this Isaiah, for revival. Isaiah 8 and the 20th verse. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. This was one of Wesley's favorite verses. That will be John Wesley. People who will not accept the word of God, the Bible as authoritative, are doomed to darkness, he said, and can never bring any light into this dark world. Shouldn't that be speaking, crying out to what calls itself church today? Because... They're not accepting the word of God. You Church of England, you're not accepting the word of God as authoritative. You're doing just the opposite. And what does this say? Are doomed to darkness and can never bring any light into this dark world. Consider that, O oh God, shake the Church of England till it can be shaken no more. And should it not repent of its wickedness in rejecting thy word, 
then bring the Church of England to the to its end. The Hebrides, Revival and Awakening, 1949 to 1953. A short history, compiled from different sources by Alec Dunn, who acknowledges these sources. So, they now reach 1952. In January 1952, Duncan Campbell started a mission in Stornoway, the main town in Lewis. At first things were very difficult due to the opposition. Even through attendances, though attendances were good and some were seeking the Saviour. But after calling in reinforcements in the second week, God broke through, and Duncan was able to report that they were in the midst of revival blessing. On the final night, we witnessed a mighty manifestation of the power of God. This was due to the young Donald MacPhail from Arnold. As he was praying, God swept in, in power. And in a few minutes, some people were lying prostrate on the floor, while others fell into a trance. We were in the midst of it until one o'clock in the morning. Yes, sounds very much like Daniel Nash, yet Donald, who was converted at a very young age, the, early on in the revival, what was he, something like 15 when he was converted. And the number of times that Duncan Campbell refers to Donald, it would have been quite amazing, quite wonderful, if I'd ever had the opportunity of of meeting Donald MacPhail. And they've never found anything out about him. Not even when I've been on the Isle of Lewis, I've spoken with one from that I've know from the who come from the Isle of Lewis. I've been there. Perhaps Donald went to the glory many years ago. But he gave his all to the Lord God and cried out to God, and God so wonderfully, wonderfully answered time and time again. The missioner then went to Edinburgh and Inverness, but I often wondered what would have happened, might have happened if he had stayed. The breakthrough had come in the heart of the Free Church territory, and then he left. Had he taken full advantage of this breakthrough and continued the mission, the back of the free church opposition, let's, let's just take hold of that. The free church opposition, that which called itself Christianity, was, was resisting, was fighting God. could have been broken and the work of the Holy Spirit could have spread even more mightily especially in view of the mountain opposition that Duncan faced in the months ahead. In February 1952 Duncan was back in Kalanish but bitter opposition and misunderstanding had hindered the work. He asked for much prayer, as the enemy is busy on the island, and the revival spirit is being restricted. 
A new breakthrough would set it ablaze again. So, so pray hard. By the second week he was able to report that. The Spirit of God is working in the parish. Already souls are in great distress and are coming to the Saviour. Oh, that in these days there will be such conviction of sins that souls will be in great distress. Better to be under the conviction of sin and in great distress than find that you have taken your last breath and you are in hell fire itself whose torments are forevermore. This is so serious. Your greatest decision in life, the only one which will count for eternity, is what think ye of this man, Jesus Christ? What are you, have you done with Jesus Christ? Have you accepted him? as your own personal saviour, having repented of your sins and given your life wholly to him, for him to do whatever he wants to do with your life, that he becomes your Lord as well as your saviour, set on fire for him, living for him and for the glory of God and the kingdom of God whereby God becomes your Father. That's what God created you for, that he will become your Father. Only you can make that decision. We had a meeting on Saturday night in the house and it was crowded with unsaved young people. Oh, for those unsaved young people to come to hear the word of God these days, not to be in that which calls itself church and is no different from the world. But where the God is pre word of God is preached in the power and authority of the Holy Ghost, under the unction of the Holy Ghost. The four beds in the house were packed with them. All the rooms were full, and the beds were used for seating. We have never witnessed anything like this in Carloway before. He realized that he needed to change his program and stay in this district. The following week he reported that the Spirit of God is working in the parish and it is evident that a deep hunger for God has laid hold upon the people. On March 7th, several young men from Arnold came to our assistance and as we Donald prayed, ah, Donald MacPhail again, God came down in mighty power and before his prayer ended, souls were rejoicing in deliverance. This meeting will stand out as one of the great meetings of the revival. And for our final part today, the intercession of Rhys Howells by Doris M. Rusko. Published by the Lutterworth Press. And for chapter, starting chapter 7, which is called The Village Years, Part 3. From the time that the Holy Spirit took that final and absolute control, Priest Howells was led into a period of much more intensive intercession. A chain of events led him under the guidance of the Holy Spirit to make a final break with all home ties 
and live and to live apart alone with God. Outwardly it often seemed a path of failure but in reality his fellowship with the Lord was deepened and strengthened and as he was being prepared for the wider ministry of latter years to understand some of the Lord's ways with him at this time it must be remembered that social conventions of the turn of the 20th century were very different from those of today for instance men of all classes wore hats or caps out of doors as a matter of course and not to do so put a person beyond the pale socially and to allow hair and beard to grow and trimmed was the mark of a social outcast all this Rhys Howells was required to do that he might identify himself with the lowest and die to the opinion of the world to his friends and especially to his own family in all this although it involved many a struggle at first the Holy Spirit brought him through into wonderful victory so that he could rejoice in the Lord in the midst of the deepest deprivation and glory in the triumph of the, of the Savior over all the power of the enemy in human life he entered into a deep personal experience of the love of Christ a relationship which he always spoke of as the bride in latter years when release would come after periods of stress and tension he could always revert to this relationship and be refreshed and renewed in the love of his Lord Lord Jesus what a relationship to be in which leads to that which is to be refreshed and renewed in the love of yourself and at this time to apply in intercession that triumph of thyself over all the power of the enemy in human life lead on at this time in the triumphs of thy victory so that those in this ministry shall be released to go forward in the next stage of the will of God for this particular ministry and for the reaching of every creature with the gospel this is asked in your name and for the glory of the father alone that he shall be glorified through the son amen